This is Edward Siegel. Welcome to the Crisis Ahead podcast. Each week, we look at how companies, organizations, and individuals in the news are responding to, managing, or recovering from a crisis, and what you can learn from their successes or failures. My observations and recommendations are based on my experience managing crisis situations and advising others on how to respond to and bounce back from disasters, scandals, and other emergencies. My guest this week is Kurt Mansberger, Chief Technology Officer of the Boston Public Library. He'll discuss how the library responded to the pandemic and what others can learn from their experience. Kurt will be with us shortly. But first, I want to share with you something that I told Fast Company in a recent interview. A best practice in crisis management is to put a crisis behind you as quickly as possible. But the Me Too movement seems to have turbocharged corporate executives and PR people to move even faster. The speed at which allegations of sexual misconduct are addressed can send an important message about how seriously companies regard these urgent issues. A rapid corporate response can also help mitigate potential damage to an organization's brand, image, reputation, profits, and relations with the public. A story about allegations of sexual harassment was in the news recently. The Washington Post reported that 15 former female employees of the NFL team in Washington, D.C., along with two journalists who covered the team, accused staffers at the football franchise of sexual harassment and verbal abuse. Team owner Dan Snyder quickly responded to the charges. He said, quote, The behavior described in yesterday's Washington Post article has no place in our franchise or society. This story has strengthened my commitment to setting a new culture and standard for our team, a process that began with the hiring of Coach Rivera earlier this year. Unquote. Do you have policies and procedures in place to help prevent this kind of crisis? If yes, then are your employees aware of those policies and procedures? What are the first things you would do if members of your staff said they were being sexually harassed by fellow workers? And what would you do if they took their allegations to the media? I've written a new book that provides important advice on how you can prevent, manage, and recover from this and dozens of other kinds of crisis situations. Crisis Ahead, 101 Ways to Prepare for and Bounce Back from Disasters, Scandals, and Other Emergencies. Crisis Ahead is now available as a paperback book wherever books are sold and as an ebook from Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Crisis Ahead is filled with case studies about how companies and public figures have prepared for and handled crisis situations and the important lessons you can learn from their successes and failures. The book also includes checklists and exercises to help you get ready for and react to a crisis. You can learn more about the book at publicrelations.com. It's not too early to start preparing for the next crisis. That's because history shows there is always a next crisis, and the sooner you are ready for it, the better. I'm pleased to welcome my guest today, Kurt Mansberger, who is the Chief Technology Officer at the Boston Public Library. He has over 15 years of experience in technology and management consulting. Kurt has guided organizations through major custom development projects that streamline how they operate. He also led the transition of the Boston Public Library staff from an in-person to a remote operating model. I'm glad you could join me today, Kurt. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, Edward. Did the library have a crisis management plan in place before the pandemic? If so, what changes, if any, did it have to make to the plan in order to respond to the coronavirus crisis? So we had both a crisis management plan and an emergency procedures manual. However, neither was particularly suited for this type of crisis as they generally focus on things like damage to our collections or our buildings. Meanwhile, the services we prioritized didn't prioritize with the expectation of a global pandemic. So that said, the internal communication structures that we had in place with those plans enabled us to quickly make decisions and communicate them out as we closed down. In the end, we used what we could from the plans and worked closely with and consulted with the city of Boston, healthcare professionals, and library professionals throughout the country to chart our course. Meanwhile, 
shutting down created the space for staff to think more creatively about our services and empowered them to contribute ideas on how we could not only return a similar service, but make improvements along the way. When and how did the Boston Public Library decide to close because of COVID-19? So the, the decision was ultimately made by the leadership team as a whole, uh, but it was obviously um, you know, taken into consideration what the city uh, uh, thought about that and also health professionals and, and library professionals throughout the country. Uh, so uh, some other libraries closed before us, uh, most notably you know, Seattle was experiencing the closure before it was in was as bad as it was in Boston. Uh, so we could kind of learn from what they did and, and uh, make educated decision uh, based off of that. So uh, it, it, it probably took a few days to make that decision. But when the decision was made, it was it was pretty immediate that that day when people left, they were not going to be coming back into the building and that we were shutting down for a undetermined amount of time. What were some of the unknowns that had to be dealt with as the crisis unfolded? Well, I think there's there's so many unknowns with uh, with this crisis that uh, you know really there there are health concerns and you know what what can you do how can you pivot in a safe way? So for us, I think that the uh, the most valuable thing was understanding how long will the virus live on on books and other materials so that we could think about how do we you know, reopen and what that timeline might be to allow us to do that. Uh, you know, the reality is, is that we're still learning a lot. So we're continuing to, to change as we learn more. How did the pandemic affect your operations and activities? So first, I want to give you a little um, understanding of the scale. So uh, we offer about 10,000 in-person programs each year. And we also have about 4 million people come into our buildings every year. Uh, so among these patrons, we have a huge variety of patrons and the libraries really are many things to many different people. Uh, so when we had to close our doors due to this pandemic, it certainly impacted a lot of people. Our initial shift was uh, obviously focused on offering more online services, uh, which we did already provide on a statewide level. Uh, so the, the you know, quick, uh, thought that comes to mind is ebooks. So we, we doubled down on our investment to ebooks. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing that took a lot more effort for us to do was uh, in shifting all of our events from in person to online. So those events, you know, you're thinking about author talks, children's story times, uh, etc. So uh, the other thing we needed to be thinking about with this pandemic was um, what other systemic inequalities exist that are going to be multiplied when uh, when we're considering the digital equity gap and, and thinking about those patrons who depend on the library for their computer and internet access. Uh, so we had to find new ways to reach our patrons, uh, which was especially hard while we were closed. Uh, so you know, initially we were thinking about uh, getting books to people. Well, we don't know if our books are uh, infected or at risk. So this, we actually, uh, had a really great uh, solution to. The uh, local bookstores are obviously Im impacted as well, and we were able to work with them to purchase books from them and then get to uh, community organizations that were still open uh, to try to reach our patrons in new and different ways while our buildings were closed. Uh, meanwhile, we also wanted to consider how do we get internet to certain patrons, and uh, so we focused around the uh, Boston Public Health Commission locations that didn't have internet and provided hotspots to them. We also donated a set of iPads to some homeless shelters. And, uh, and we also found some people who really needed some uh, Chromebooks at home and, and offered to loan them out, which we typically don't do. Uh, so trying to find a way to use the technology we have while we're, while we're closed and reach those people that are, that are most in need. Uh, you know, meanwhile, the other uh, complexity here is that we have about 500 staff and patrons that historically report to work in person and show up for meetings in person. Uh, they also have a varied uh, level of comfort with technology and, and also uh, you know, a mix of technology available at home. So you know, when we shut down, it was rather 
uh, abrupt. Uh, we had to get devices to those people that needed it. We needed to get internet in their home or hotspot for them to be able to access the internet from their home. We also had to quickly roll out video conferencing platform, a collaboration software, uh, and provide all that training and support to make sure that them transitioning uh, onto those new technologies was successful. What role did the IT department play in the response to the crisis? So a key thing that we did in the IT department to support online programming was shifting the AV team to support online events instead of in person. This immediately gave staff running events the support and guidance they needed to be successful. You know, they, they're extremely good at what they do in person, but this was a whole new experience for them where they needed to be, you know, we needed to make sure they have the right hardware, they have the right software, and then all, of course, educating them on how to refine their backdrop, the lighting in their homes, and uh, of course, audio while recording in their home. Uh, so we did this through you know, some initial training, followed by an ongoing Q&A to make sure they got their support uh, throughout uh, all of the programming and throughout our closure as we continue to do. Uh, so this crisis really allowed us to lean into online programming as a part of our services. However, now that some restrictions have loosened, we're hosting more profile events from our own spaces so that we can control the quality and stream more. But meanwhile, all attendees join remotely. Long term, I see this as really being a sweet spot for us as we uh, at one point can, can have in-person attendees, but are really uh, expanding the access to people well beyond those that can make it inside of our, our spaces. Uh, another big thing that we did was offering more services over the phone. So one thing was uh, offering technical assistance by dialing into a support number. And that is something that's particularly challenging for people who are brand new to computers or brand new to a smartphone and, uh, and may not be able to make it in. So we're, we're reaching more and more patrons who may not have been regulars or may not even known what was offered by the library in the past. Did the library launch any new initiatives because of the coronavirus? Like one of the biggest initiatives that we had was rolling out Microsoft Teams. And what it was really about was trying to make it so that it was easy for people to communicate remotely, which they'd never done before. And rolling out something like that is just a huge effort. The, um, you know, it's got messaging, video conferencing, file management, uh, channel and topical conversation management. You know, how do you train everybody, get them up to speed and, uh, and get them adopting it? Uh, it's not an easy thing. Thing to do, but the the reality was that we had to pivot so quickly that we had to really focus on how do we get the tools to the tech savvy people to make them be able to be productive as quickly as possible, and then uh, kind of bring along those that aren't as tech savvy at a pace that was uh, more acceptable to them, where they are more likely to adopt the platform, and that's still an ongoing process. But, uh, but I think we did it the right way that, uh, you know, we uh, focus on those people who are going to be force multipliers throughout the organization and uh, to our patrons first, uh, and then kind of make sure that we have a, a slower approach for those that are less tech savvy. Rolling out this, this new collaboration platform helped streamline our processes during the crisis, but it'll of course be uh, a long uh, positive impact. Uh, it'll, it'll have a long positive impact on how we operate ongoing long after we return to our office spaces. What feedback did you receive from patrons once you started to reopen? As patrons came in the door, uh, I, I don't think anybody um, said, said anything uh, remotely uh, average everybody was ecstatic that we had reopened and thanked us for reopening and thanked us for their everything that we did uh, to give them a sense of community while we were still closed. Uh, so that was just such a great experience for me and allowed me to kind of come back refreshed as I uh, jumped back into the next initiative. What did you learn because of COVID-19 and how will that affect your activities going forward? 
So our biggest shift, as you imagine, has been in pivoting to offering more online and remote services. And what we have learned about the online space has driven us further and faster than we could have imagined. And those services are not going away. Uh, with events as an example, those with disabilities might be more likely to join an event from the comforts uh, of their homes. Um, people with tougher work or childcare schedules can now watch recordings after the fact. So I definitely don't see a lot of this changing uh, as we reopen. We're more likely to double down on our online programming. Based on your experience dealing with the pandemic, what advice do you have for others on how to prepare for and respond to a crisis? So when we had this uh, crisis occur, we, we had plans in place. Um, those plans were really a crisis management plan and emergency procedures manual, but it was never really focused on this type of crisis. Uh, it was more like damage to our buildings or damage to our collections, uh, how we might need to pivot to a new location, but never have we thought that we would need to, to shut down completely uh, and kind of have a global pandemic like this. Uh, so I, I'm reminded of the quote from President Eisenhower of how plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And, you know, for us, while these plans didn't uh, provide a you know, how-to manual of what we were gonna do when this crisis hit, there was still a lot of value within them that we could use as we uh, began to pivot and which allowed us to do that more quickly. Uh, so, so the key advice that I would have is, you know, A, make sure you are planning uh, when you do make that pivot, um, be thinking about the the opportunities, leveraging what you what you have when you were planning, but then also keeping a focus on your your patrons or your customers, uh, as prioritization within a crisis becomes infinitely more important. How can people learn more about the Boston Public Library? Well, the best place to learn more about us is just by visiting our website at bpl. Dot org. So Boston Public Library, bpl.org. And uh, you, can, you can learn a lot about us. And if you're a resident in Massachusetts uh, and you aren't a member yet, you should sign up for one of our e-cards and start uh, using our, our remote virtual services today. My guest today has been Kurt Mansberger, the Chief Technology Officer at the Boston Public Library. Thanks again for joining me today, Kurt. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Crisis Ahead podcast. Remember, it's not a matter of if companies and organizations will have a crisis, but when. 